Hello, hello, hello. The open online briefing process that I love so much and that I really welcome you at is now becoming super special selective. And I'm welcoming everyone here and encouraging you to be really uh, engaged. I want to give a massive, massive shout out to Chris Shipton. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the constant support of live illustration throughout this process. I'd like to invite uh, Catherine Deland and Mihika Acharya to uh, just say whatever they want to. Perhaps Mihika, you might want to just uh, say anything about how we're running it. And then Catherine, I'd like you to just introduce us. Mihika, please. Uh, thanks, David. Just wanted to thank Chris Shipton again and Live Illustrations for being there always and making our uh, meetings so interesting. Um, and normally, uh, I think Catherine will run through um, the meeting and then we'll go back to David, who will explain about uh, an update on COVID and his role with the Global Crisis Response Group. And then we'll ask whoever needs to speak if they want to speak. So uh, handing over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, Vika. Um, and welcome to everybody. Happy Friday. I hope you are looking forward to having a great weekend and I hope that this Friday is ending a great week for you. Um, just a reminder that we record these uh, briefings and then we load them up onto the ForestD website. So if in the event that you say something or that you feel is sensitive or that you'd like to have edited out, please do let us know. Me and Mihika, I'll make sure our addresses are in the chat as always. But otherwise, welcome. There's some interesting COVID trends going on. And I think that we might have the opportunity to really spread our wings a little bit and talk about how COVID is affecting a whole bunch of different sectors and what it looks like in the world. Really looking forward to David's briefing and his thoughts. So with that, David, over to you. Good, okay, greetings to everyone. Uh, just to say that um, sometimes when I'm thinking about COVID, I say to myself, it's a great revealer. And more and more, I believe that COVID continues to display inequities and unfairness and vulnerabilities in systems everywhere. And it's actually disturbing a lot of systems, particularly the systems on which the two or three billion people in our world who are often identified as poor depend for their continued existence. There's a web of interactions that are necessary for poor people's livelihoods. And just looking at what's happening everywhere, that web has been quite badly disturbed. In particular, it's led to less opportunities for poor people to maintain their incomes, partly because of unemployment and partly because of loss of remittances and so on. And that in turn is actually damaging aspects of their lives. And the damage is, is, is quite serious. And we believe that we're seeing it happening in real time. It's damage that will be described by those who study what's going on in the world uh, through statistics that will be retrospective. But, but we think that it might be actually happening in front of our eyes. And I'm going to try to uh, indicate this, as Catherine said, and Mihika said, sorry, by reference to two processes in which I'm involved. So the World Health Assembly 2022 starts next week, starts with a uh, uh, walk the talk exercise uh, for health in Geneva on the 22nd on Sunday. And then there are uh, opening speeches on Sunday afternoon, followed by all the debates and it's the financing of the World Health Organization uh, that will be one of the issues to be discussed. The, the general feeling is that COVID is moving into what might, one might call uh, the endemic state and there will be a lot of discussion about how that's happening and so the focus will be on how to 
ensure, ensure adequate finance and um, independence for the World Health Organization so that it is able to support public health globally for the uh, coming uh, year, months and years ahead. And so keep a look out for that. Those of you who are uh, involved in the World Health Assembly, I look forward to your presenting any thoughts. And those of you who are uh, close to your national delegations, anything you've got about what's uppermost in their minds, be very interesting. Uh, I know that those of us who work as special envoys on COVID are going to have a face-to-face -face meeting on uh, probably on Thursday, the 26th, and the future arrangements for the envoy ship will be discussed. Uh, I'm anticipating that my own role will continue, and it is my intention, unless there is any uh, problem, to continue with these open online briefings. But we may reshape them a bit, given some of the other things that are going on. So let's just think a bit about global COVID right now. Well, there's an awful lot of confusion among the public everywhere. And what that's leading to, as far as I can tell, in the minds of many, is a wish to actually shake themselves free of the, the frustration of having to think all the time about COVID and to try instead to look on other things. Shaking free, moving forward. And, and I mean, that's all fine, but my line is still, let's do everything we can to apply the learning of the last two and a quarter years. Let's do all we can to use that learning to make sure that as this virus continues to move around in human populations, that everything possible is done to prevent it from creating such uncertainty and suffering and stress that life can go on, particularly for poorer people who are often in insecure employment and do not have uh, spaces where they can easily isolate themselves. The messaging has to be clear. The virus is still here. It's not a good virus at all. There's nothing good about getting it. And we need to do everything possible to anticipate further surges, which will come at three to four monthly intervals, with the interval depending on the immune status of the particular population and uh, the capacity of whichever viral variant is around to bypass immunity and to cause disease. But what sort of disease is it? Well, certainly talking to people who've got COVID at the moment, and I seem to know a few of them, it continues to be a respiratory disease. But they've got symptoms that suggest that it's also a, a microvascular disease. It's a disease that's causing problems in little blood vessels and those problems don't actually necessarily go away as soon as the virus is cleared out of the respiratory system. So people can be negative in terms of their COVID status by PCR through nasopharyngeal swab and still be having problems uh, subsequently. They might be due to bits of whole virus that are still around or fragments of virus that are around but this virus seems to have the ability to change the way in which aspects of people's immune system and people's clotting system works. And that means they get prolonged symptoms that may be in their respiratory tract, that may be in their blood vessels, that may be in, uh, to do with problems inside their central nervous system. And those prolonged symptoms are called long COVID. Sometimes, those symptoms are come on some months after the COVID infection. So they could also be called post-COVID. And there are aspects of post-COVID that are, are, of course, disquieting. One of them is the possibility that people who've had COVID, the symptoms disappear, but then within a year or two, they may have 
a higher likelihood of strokes or heart disease. Then there are children who, as a result of perhaps the changes in the immune system of people, uh, as a result of COVID, find it less easy to cope with adenovirus infection in their livers. And the hepatitis epidemic that I talked about here uh, at three, uh, five weeks ago is still progressing and is associated with a lot of uh, illness and unfortunately a number of children dying. And there will be other phenomena that uh, appear that will be identified as being associated with the sequels of COVID as part of long COVID or post-COVID. And we need to be prepared for that. And so that means I say to everybody, do try to protect yourself from COVID. And then people tell me, I met some people this week, well, I've had my third infection. I had one in 2020, I had one in 2021. I've just had another one, 2022. They, they, they're not pleasant, they make me feel terrible. And then they say to me, and you know, each time I have a COVID, it's slightly longer to get back to being normal. And I still feel fuzzy in the head. Sometimes I wake up not being able to link my head to my arms, to my legs, or not being able to do my exercise. And I say, yep, I'm not surprised. This phenomenon of, of nasty things happening after you have your COVID infection occurs with your second or with your third round of being infected with COVID. So I say to everybody, try to avoid getting it. Because I'm increasingly convinced by the work of uh, colleagues who've joined us in these briefings, Claire Rayner particularly, and others in her group, and also David Fedson, who was with us uh, about uh, two briefings ago. And because I think that it's important we understand that infection with this virus does change the way in which the blood, ve blood behaves in small blood vessels. And you do get uh, microvascular disease, which is little clots because of damage to the lining of blood vessels. But what I'm actually asking everybody to do is please to think what might the therapies be that are useful if you've got microvascular disease. Now, I don't want to get accused of promoting therapies, so I have to be very careful here, but I want to tell you that I'm asking the people who are looking at possible therapies to reduce the incidence of symptoms associated with long COVID, to look at the kind of simple medicines that are available off patents that can reduce the capacity of blood to clot in little blood vessels. And because I've had a few problems with my own blood vessels in the past, I take small doses of aspirin every day, around 100 milligrams, and I take something called statins every day. And I believe that and I hope that those kinds of medicines may turn out to be useful to deal with the microvascular disease. So I'm asking my friends who are involved in looking at medicines, don't just look at these expensive uh, antivirals that are coming on the market, but look at some of these very inexpensive off-patent medicines that are being used to stop blood from clotting. It doesn't mean you get bleeding all over the place, but to stop blood from clotting to reduce the incidence of strokes and heart attacks. Some of you probably are taking these things um, and they are thought to be incredibly useful. So let's, I'm keeping looking at that and I thought I might tell you, uh, perhaps uh, I'll ask Chris not to put too much about any individual medicine names on that because I do not want to be thought to be somebody who's promoting uh, medication without it being properly tested. Now, when it comes to how we act. If we accept that the future of COVID is regular surges when immunity dies down, and then perhaps when new variants like BA2 come along, then you will get a surge of cases. What are we worried about? Well, first of all, we want, uh, when the surge starts to build up early on, let's do everything possible to prevent people from being infected. 
It's during those early, early weeks of a surge that it matters. So don't throw away your masks, keep them there. And if by any chance you've decided to stop wearing them, uh, except in indoor and crowded places now, be ready to get them out again. Look in New York right now, where uh, Mayor Adams, he's not issued what's called a mask mandate, but on the basis of really good surveillance data done by the Department of Public Health in New York City, he's saying a surge is coming up again. Or listen to what's happening in some countries in continental Europe, where even though testing has dropped, 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 and so you can't rely on the routine testing figures, where they are doing surveillance studies and they're showing that yes, the surge is coming. So there's definitely going to be in various parts of the world, a May, June, 2022 surge, which comes about four to five months after the January, February surges. And uh, it'll be cases, but uh, we hope that it will not be a lot of people dying because we hope there'll be enough immunity in the population to mean that there won't be deaths. And so that means that many governments are saying, uh, could you now have uh, a fourth shot, a fourth immunization dose, if you are older than 60, you are at high risk if you get infected, not just high risk of, of severe illness and death, but you're also at high risk of long COVID, and that's boring. Nobody wants to get long COVID if they can help it, so avoid getting infected if you can. Now, just remember that actually we have a really rather bad uh, outbreak going on in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The Emergencies Director of WHO, Dr. Mike Ryan, has said that the high levels of transmission and DPRK are very much among unvaccinated people is creating a high risk of sickness, a high risk of death, and also a high risk of the emergence of new variants, especially if people are taking uh, immunosuppressives or their immune system is not very strong. What happens is the virus sticks around for a long time and the variant emergence becomes quite likely. DPRK having reported no cases at all in 2020 and 2021, on Thursday reported 262,270 new suspected cases, not suspected all on the basis of testing, but suspected on the basis of symptoms, meaning that the caseload of people who are reported of having COVID in Democratic People's Republic of Korea is now 2 million. And that's only a week after the outbreak has been acknowledged. If anybody says to you COVID is finished, just tell them that. And it's not just in DPRK across the border in mainland China, uh, we have evidence of continued COVID infections and high levels of hospitalization. In the United States, with rising levels of COVID, people are going to their medical practitioners and asking to use antivirals. And they, uh, Pfizer Inc. have a, a oral antiviral treatment called Paxlovid, there's been a 300% jump in its use over the past four weeks. Uh, it's, uh, it's got some pretty good effectiveness at reducing severity of illness. If it started early, we don't know what it does for long COVID. But the, um, uh, as well as having the New York City uh, uh, advice, uh, also we're finding some businesses in the US are really rethinking their back to office plans, including some pretty well known. Uh, businesses like Apple. I've told you a bit about the hepatitis challenge. I just want to stress that uh, uh, there is uh, quite a challenging situation uh, in many countries. The Indian authorities looked at 475 children across the country uh, who have uh, been tested positive for COVID-19 in the past. 47 of them presented with severe hepatitis. And uh, 10 of them were found to have symptoms of something called multiple inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, 37 
had COVID-19 associated hepatitis in children. So uh, all I want to say is it's not finished, it's not nice, and we need to continue now becoming a slightly sort of strange band of people, people like myself, sort of saying, it's not gone away, continue to take it seriously, prevent transmission, especially when cases start to rise, protect those most at risk by ensuring that they do get their, keep their vaccinations up to date, which in the European and North American situation does mean uh, probably having your fourth dose because you want to keep your antibody titers up. They're also saying um, prepare for how the surges will come, prepare for nasty new variants. And more and more colleagues in virology are saying there's no certainty that new variants will be mild. Now look what's going on around the world. Look what's going on in different countries as they come to terms with this challenge of the uh, of uh, COVID and what COVID is doing. Uh, I thought I might actually just spend a few moments just reflecting on what's happened. And to do that, the easiest thing to do is to just show you some slides and I'll see if I can do that quickly because we've got a, 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 a problem. I have to spend a moment or two just finding a slide that I want you to see. And it's so interesting. The slide I want to show you has been produced by something called the Global Crisis Response Group of, uh, set up by the United Nations Secretary General. I talked to you about it before, and uh, uh, let's just see what they are saying. There are sort of vicious cycles starting to emerge that have been very much triggered by what's happening with COVID. Food prices are at record levels. Oil prices are at record levels. Costs of sending stuff by ship are at record levels. And this is all resulting in a global cost of living crisis that has been very much triggered by the impact of COVID on economies everywhere and also uh, by ongoing climate change and conflict. Now, it's certainly been uh, really pushed forward by the uh, conflict in Ukraine, but um, it is particularly uh, in invidious. Now, I want to try to show you one other slide from the UN Secretary General's Global Crisis Response Group. It's not yet reported. I hope you can read it. Basically, the position of the United Nations is that poor people throughout the world have, as we've discussed in these briefings often, been really overburdened as a result of the impact of COVID-19 on their lives. It's gonna get worse. For every percentage point increase in food prices, 10 million more people are pushed into poverty. Now, obviously that's a bit of a, a, a difficult one, but basically food prices are rising in some parts of the world over the last three months on average by seven to 10%. And that means for certain people in certain places, they've gone up 20 or 30 percent over the last three months. And given the combination of increased uh, food price, increased prices, uh, also drought and other climate change factors and the impact of COVID, we actually have a, 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 seri a series of micro famines occurring in parts of the world, drought affected parts of the world which are contributing to 47 million people facing food insecurity right now 
adding to the 193 million people more facing insecurity since the pandemic, taking us up towards 800 million to 900 million people in our world with a population of 7.8 billion are facing insecurity of their food, which means that they are likely to actually suffer premature death. And 60% um, of those who are food insecure and at risk of becoming undernourished are women and girls. Uh, an awful lot of them are young children. And so the impact of this post-COVID food, energy and finance crisis that is deepening every week and that is actually putting more and more people into extreme poverty is being felt most by women and girls. Also, uh, those who are trying to farm in uh, uh, poor countries who've got what we call small holdings, usually farming less than half a hectare, if it's good soil, rather larger acreage, if it's bad soil. These small holders are having to sell their animals, go into deeper debt, often paying 15 to 20% a month in interest, and in an increasing number of cases, again, particularly in areas affected by climate change, they are migrating, migrating to urban areas where they are not e finding it easy to get employment. And of course, the swelling of urban areas leads to an increased risk of civil unrest. So we've got rural poverty, migration, urban poverty, and in general, a, a really very difficult situation. Compounding this is a fertilizer crunch because fertilizer prices are linked very closely to energy prices, but with a particular problem that one of the three major fertilizer ingredients, potash, is produced primarily by Belarus and Russia. And so that is leading to added stress for fertilizer. Now, it's really difficult to see easy ways to resolve the current crisis. What's basically happening is that there is big instability in food markets because of a lot of grains and oil seeds stuck in warehouses uh, um, in Odessa, a port in southern Ukraine. And because that food can't be got out, it isn't on the open market, it's led to a slimming of the market. Uh, with the high fertilizer prices, that's also led to uh, lower yields already in West Africa. But in, added into all this, there's an enormous amount of speculation going on. And, and that commonly happens in food crises. And so taken together, it is just pushing up prices everywhere. And as you can see here, that impacts on poor people everywhere. So basically, we've got this happening. I've talked to some of you about it in detail because it needs a political response. And the reason why I'm a bit more forthright about it right now is that uh, the Global Crisis Response Group set up by the United Nations Secretary General is now working very closely with uh, a number of groups of countries, the G7 nations, who've set up a global alliance for food security, which includes a very strong support from all G7 nations. And we are beginning through this global crisis response group to set out clearly some priorities so that everybody is moving in the same direction. But there's also strong support coming from the African Union under the leadership of President Macky Sall of Senegal. There's strong support coming in Caribbean region, in Latin America, throughout Asia, uh, as well as um, also in Europe and North America and the Middle East. Now, it's not easy to deal with. You know, what can you do? 
You can't suddenly pump up production uh, in the in food systems around the world. And you have to be, anyway, if you are going to increase production, you have to be careful. Remember that in Europe, countries have agreed to something called the Green New Deal. Countries have agreed to the farm to fork strategy, which is trying to discourage the consumption of foods that are bad for nutrition and bad for health. And the last thing that anybody wants in this crisis, following on from COVID and climate change, is to see governments walking back on agreements that they've made to decarbonize food production, to contribute to nature positive food production, and to contribute to food that is good for health and nutrition. But it, it's starting to happen. The slip back is occurring. And it's occurring quite quickly. So within the Global Crisis Response Group and the work being done by the United Nations, there's a strong effort to say, yes, increase production, but don't do it uh, by going against all the things that we've worked so hard on over the past two or three decades. And we're also saying, do your best not to impose imp export bans like India has just done on wheat, or like Indonesia has done, we think temporarily on palm oil. They're not, they don't help. And in fact, what happens is they tend to have a domino effect and that drives up prices. But most importantly, this global crisis response group is saying, it's a cost of living crisis. There's no elasticity in the incomes of poor people. In fact, for some of them, they are constrained, constrained, constrained because employment opportunities have been tighter. Hi, everyone. Um, it looks like David has frozen. We're having a thunderstorm here, and I wonder if it isn't interrupting some of the internet connectivity, because I think Mahika is also frozen. Um, so let's give them a minute and, and see how we go. Uh, I, I do love the fact that we live in this terribly advanced country, but the weather can interrupt our internet. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll give David a second to return. Yeah, it's definitely part of the building because I'm having it. Thanks, Mahika. Last time that happened was when uh, there was a breakdown in orange internet because cables were sabotaged. I hope that's not happened again. Uh, 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 I suspect my colleague Mahika may have also had it. Please excuse me. So in summary, it's a cost of living crisis. And the only way to deal with it uh, is through very strong accessible social protection measures. Now, if governments are at the same time as trying to deal with this cost of living crisis, are also trying to terminate the employment of 20% of their civil servants, and will probably go for frontline workers first, that is absolutely serious, serious, serious. So in our global crisis response group, we are saying maintain strong social protection measures everywhere. Get more money to governments so they got more fiscal headroom so that they can increase their social protection. Because without that, poverty will increase, suffering will increase, civil unrest will increase, illness will increase, death will increase. And uh, frankly, as a public health person, that just doesn't seem to be right. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I look forward to seeing whether or not you're, you're comfortable with the way I try to link these things together uh, back to 
uh, uh, Catherine for the uh, little um, interlude. Just really quickly, um, Chris, again, thank you so much for being here. We can't tell you how much we appreciate your time. Um, do you wanna just give us a little bit of a walkthrough? I, I, the, I like, is, is the left-hand side a sort of stage for inequity, inequity and vulnerabilities? I love it. Uh, yeah, hi, no, yes, I was trying to do a big reveal joke. Um, oh, I like the big reveal. Um, needs a little bit of refinement, but um, hopefully I've caught the main points. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a while since I've done one of these, so it is, it's interesting sort of doing this, um, it's very different field to the situation in the UK right now. Um, as probably other people in the UK um, are, are aware, uh, basically sort of forgotten that COVID exists and just almost completely moved on. Um, and you see the occasional person wearing a mask and you're reminded of it with a sort of slight sense of guilt. But, um, you know, the, the, the reality is it's still there. It's the point is... I hopefully I put that in a sort of big bold text to remind myself, but hopefully anybody else has looked at this. And uh, and I, I just I mean it does feel like we're lurching from crisis to crisis, but um, I think that's the world in twenty twenty two. But yeah, um, and the same and Chris, it's awful that the same households that were have been badly hit by COVID still are being badly hit by COVID will be the ones who are badly hit by the cost of living crisis. I think that's what really burns us up in uh, the Global Crisis Response Group. I don't know whether that makes sense to you. I, I think, you know, it, it does. And like this, I mean, it's amazing how it is all inter interlinked. And I've done a very shabby yeah. kind of web drawing to try and just hint at that. But um, I, I think, you know, the people who, people do know about this and do care about it. And, mm. um, and one way or another, this cost of living crisis is hitting everyone, even if you're relatively well healed, yeah. you, you, you know, it's, it's gonna bite you one way or another. Yeah. Um, I suppose that just try to think of the positive is that, you know, that means hopefully everyone is harder to ignore and yeah. people who are taking action will be better recognized on a grander scale? Well, you know, all of us who are involved in these various uh, campaigns around the sustainable development goals or COVID-19 or now the cost of living crisis in my case, I mean, we realize that actually trying to make sure that poor people get a better deal in terms of opportunities or in terms of healthcare or in terms of access to nutritious food and that it doesn't suddenly stop. I mean, just look at, I mean, I'm man, okay, but if I were woman right now, I would be thinking, I, I've been fighting for more rights for women. And I felt in 2015, 16, things were getting better and bam, it looks as though in some places they're being a bit taken away. I mean, I'm, I'm trying very much to, um, to constantly remind myself that though we would like it to be a world in which you advance and you advance and you advance and each time you advance, it's just that bit better, like through the co conferences on population and development, the reality is that things can unravel quite quickly and they unravel un unevenly. I, I think I, you, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you, no, you, yeah, come in. My only other, my only other sort of point to support that would be that, um, you know, as, as you said sort of earlier in your um, yeah. words about sort of historians looking back on this occasion, yeah. I think the sort of my observation is that the lesson of the early 21st century is going to be that, you know, things like democracy and our institutions mm. require maintenance. You yeah. can't take them for granted. Don't take yeah. anything for granted. Don't take any, say, say to all your children as they're going through school, you've got all this stuff, you've got all these machines, you've got football on the telly when you want it, but don't take it for granted. Anyway, that sounds carping old man. 
Chris, thank oh, you. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> but the reason why I'm talking to you special is that I'm not sure how long live illustration can go on joining us. We love what you've done. It's been the most wonderful, beautiful, symbiotic relationship. And we want to really, really thank you. And um, we know, uh, I mean, like you, you know, we know about running a business uh, a bit. We're having it a bit ourselves as well. So thank you, Chris. Please well, convey I, our I, thanks I, to everybody. I will, and we all we all are very proud of our association with these calls. But yeah. yes, um, I think we will be a bit more intermittent in the yeah. future. But you know, I will be parachuting in uh, on the special occasions to do my best for you. Rebecca, unmute and tell him what you just wrote. I verbatim. I said no. Keep them. You guys <laughs> are the best. Um, really, really, it's. It's been incredible to watch what the whole group and team does. It's obviously not easy and it just adds an extra dimension. It's not just obviously writing down verbatim what's said in these meetings. It, it, these meetings take on a whole new meeting, meaning once that graphic is done. And um, yeah, hopefully something I have had in mind for a while will come to fruition if Catherine wants to bring that up at at some point but yes please come back please stay hopefully the partnership can continue well no, we'll become a little bit more intermittent but we will be um around so don't worry um and uh yeah i'm looking i'll be um uh, parachuting in from time to time i think that's the current plan to um illustrate these but yeah well, for, for one other thing is that yeah I occasionally look back on all of these images and it, it is just like this a roller coaster ride. Mm. Um, and the one that I've, I meant to save it on my computer to display, possibly now, but I haven't, so I, I won't. But the one of the farting House of Commons yes. that I did when I was particularly cross about the world situation <laughs> is actually mentioned to me often. So. Oh, good. Very good. Stay in touch. Thank you, Chris. And look at the chat comments. It's lovely. Please copy the chat and keep it for yourselves. And if ever you want testimonials to live illustration, just let us know. We'll get you a giant testimonial book because we think you are beyond good. Oh, well, thank you. No, um, thank you. And, but thank you also for you all. Doing and there's more suggestions. They're coming in again thick and fast. Now we're going to invite Antonio to talk. He's got a very interesting point. Uh, but everybody, uh, we've had that little long part with live illustration, so two minutes each. Uh, Antonio. Yes, uh, thanks, David, and thanks again for your work on both those in interrelated crises. Uh, I think we are now, uh, we need to step up the game. If, for example, we had a one single shot at, at COVID, and in general, we didn't do, we didn't so, we didn't do so well leadership wise. But I think the, the biggest challenge for us is to develop the political will, as I mentioned in the chat that avoid this trade-off mentality. Yes, I can do food, but I have to sacrifice this. Yes, I can do COVID, but I have to compromise this. We have to take, we have to move to this from this trade-off mentality to a commons mentality. I think as from a commons perspective, I think we fail on the COVID, but now we don't have an option. We have to take that if you want to succeed as those guys become more and more intertwined. So your thoughts are appreciated, Dave. Thank you. What I'd like to do is to invite colleagues who are actually working closely with poorer people in your practice, whether it's, uh, for example, in Europe or in um, North America or elsewhere, to just talk about this and its implications. Uh, if there's any way I can prompt Karen Kaplan also to um, perhaps in a couple of minutes to talk about what you feel this means for uh, for those of us who are working uh, on um, um, uh, poverty reduction, uh, it'd be lovely to hear from you because some of you have said this needs a political response, but it's quite challenging at the moment to know where that political response can come from, except at the local level. The national level in some countries like Chile, yeah, yeah, very exciting, but you know it gets really difficult to think of the 
big powers of the G7 in particular. So just keep thinking about what are the alternative forms of political response. I'm using P here with a small P. Never am I trying to be party political here. I'm trying to be small P political. Let's go to, um, uh, I was uh, just looking at my thing. Rebecca, please. Rebecca Cantor. Oh, you put me on the... the well, then you can pass the, to Vanny. You, you don't want to pass to Vanny Felton. Um, well, two, two things. One, I saw an interesting thing from a, from a journalist in, in the U.S. as the U.S. just passed one million deaths from, from COVID. Yeah. And this journalist was saying, well, if, if COVID here is just going to keep circulating due to the sort of low vaccination rates, um, then we need to keep thinking about more therapeutics. Yeah. And, I, and I agree, like it's not, we don't need to promote specific therapeutics, but we're not even thinking about the long-term reality of having COVID circulating in the world. Okay. Then conversely here in Chile, as I put in the chat, as of June 1st, if people don't have four vaccine doses, your mobility pass will be disactivated, which means you can't do any activities indoors. It's a QR code that gets scanned. And someone asked me, well, why are they doing it? And it's partly because after three doses, the COVID infection rates still continued to go up here pretty recently. I don't know if some of that's because of the high use of Cinevac at first, and a lot of people having two or their three vaccine doses that were from Cinevac versus one of the mRNA vaccines. Um, but it still is the ethical dilemma for me. Should we have four doses here or other countries have one or none or, or, or two, but we're still not talking about, again, the long-term yeah. reality of having COVID circulating in, in, in the world. And what so that my means. advice is if it's available, take the four doses, especially if you're in the older age group uh, or have other susceptibilities. Basically, protection wanes. It's not like measles, where you get measles and your antibodies and other protections stay high for a good long time. This one, protection wanes over time. And in some people, it seems to wane super fast. Thank you, Rebecca. Annie, and then after Annie, Joan Nichols. Thanks, David. Can I just say I absolutely agree with you about things. You could never imagine that things will stay as they are. The area of Ukraine I know very well has now been bombed and destroyed. Um, and then to go back to a European perspective, well, it's still Europe. Um, the UK is changing it the way it delivers aid. So instead of sending 40% to the international organizations, it's only going to send 25. Yeah. And it's going to give more autonomy to ambassadors. Um, and it's, it's almost harking back to those old days of aid for trade provision where yeah. they want to see some advantage to um, uh, the UK. And there was no mention of poverty. Um, and so this is all appalling. Um, and um, it fits in with the political culture that we've got going on at the moment. Yeah. And so then if I come back to the local, which is what you asked, we've already recognised that because of the crisis in the cost of living, our objective of reducing inequality is, get, is already harder to achieve. And so we're already thinking, for instance, as the winter comes, we're going to move some of our staff around so that one of the big hubs we've got in, well, the, our big hub in the centre of town, we'll, we'll just have it open for people who need somewhere warm to sit. Um, and, um, and you can see this across the whole of the, uh, the country. I mean, the, the, the NHS is under unbelievable uh, pressure. It can't deliver given what what is what the pressures on it the um the uh judiciary system is the same and so you've got a whole system which is just i don't know what the word is is it screaming is it cracking but whatever it is there's you you can't depend on the national government and the local government working in sync and some of the times it doesn't matter and, and now it really does um, and so if if we can say this uh, and we you know it's like Michael Marmot one of my heroes he says we should be ashamed of ourselves that we've let the system get into this state and so Covid has made it all worse the um, the what 
the Russian behavior in Ukraine has made it worse. Um, and then the, the way that the system is so interlinked that we can't get food to the poor mm. uh, in Britain, as well as in really poor countries, it, um, you, you have to then say, OK, so I'm not going to be immobilized by this. No, you have to keep working, don't you? Act, yeah. to, to act and that's where i leave you know that's what it is what what are we as individuals and organizations going to do about this so um karen kaplan who's just written saying she's disappearing is working very hard on uh, trying to get a political mobilization among younger people i think next week in the world economic forum in davos we will have a completely different field to any previous wef with businesses looking at each other and saying, we have a role here. The Edelman Trust Barometer, which is being released on Monday, is going to show incredible shifts in, in trust around the world, which is going to make a lot of governments feel very nervous. A lot of businesses feel nervous. It's tinderbox stuff. So there are new contexts, but everybody, I think every business, Every civil society organization, every community group, every one of us needs to ask the question, what more can I do? My colleague Lawrence Haddad from the Global Alliance to Improve Nutrition said it's no excuse to say, I'm doing the kind of stuff that's right, so I just go on doing it. No, even if you're in the business, even if you're an NGO providing assistance to poor people, ask yourself, are we doing the best that we should? Annie, it's lovely to hear your example of how you've changed things in Colchester. I think that's a very, very nice example. And I hope you won't mind if I quote you. Joan Nichols, please. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think, as you know, I'm working in Kenya and in Somalia. Um, and in Kenya, the prices of normal everyday things have gone up a huge amount. So like the price of cooking oil has gone up massively, about 56%. And the price of petrol has gone up about 36%. But because the price of cooking oil has gone up, what people are trying to do is get milk from cows and turn it into fat and use that. So there's all sorts of knock-on effects. And if fuel prices go up, obviously everything gets more expensive. And in... Um, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia, there's been four failed seasons of rains or very low seasons of rain. So there's already very, very low kind of productivity, both for livestock and for crops. And the food situation is disastrous. Um, and, you know, even with huge amounts of effort going in from the UN and NGOs, um, very few people that are in need of being reached by assistance. So like for something like health, I think 12% of people that need help with health in Somalia are being reached by NGOs and the UN and the healthcare system. So um, even, you know, the normal situation that people are affected by the kind of conflict, the drought is, is made much worse. And then the price of wheat the price of fuel going up means that it's it's very hard to see how it can certainly not going to get better before it gets worse it's going to continue to get worse before things improve how has it changed your work particularly in uh, somalia the focus has shifted entirely from working on development objectives to working on protect preventing famine and to try and mitigate the worst effects of drought. So before we were trying to think about things like how you can improve water management and how you can protect the banks of rivers to make sure that there aren't problems in the future. And now it's much more focused on how do you get water to people that need it? Or you know, how do you try and keep um, sort of animals alive so that populations don't um, lose their livelihoods and that kind of thing? I, I read some uh, really awful statistics about death of livestock in the uh, Somali region of Ethiopia, in Somalia and in Northern Kenya. Uh, presumably that's all true. Presumably this is a really, really bad drought that you have right now. It, it is. And I mean, it's already been four seasons of underperforming rains, which means not enough water. 
Um, and they're now worried that the next season of rain, which anyway is meant to be a short rain, yeah. would also be an underperforming season. And that is unprecedented. This drought hasn't been as bad for about 40 years. Yeah. Um, so there isn't really very much. Um, yeah, there, there are very few opportunities to turn this around from where we are now. Livestock are dying and people are already dying, but mostly from things like diseases. But that's um, what happens weather, in famine. It's a bit Antonio's point that um, that your lack of food weakens people, they get sick quicker and boof, they just fade away. It's horrible. Uh, Joe, just one last thing. I mean, uh, in my experience, when people get like this, they don't pick up arms and become angry and shoot because they are just not in a position to do so. They can't afford them. Uh, they're not e they're not really able to protest. It's a it's a quiet and sad um, withering and death for animals and people and whole villages. Does it feel like that, or does it feel like you've also got other stuff building up? Um, well, there's a sense of optimism to a certain extent at the moment because there were just um, elections for a new president. Oh, right. So yeah. last Sunday, there was a transition of power, at least at the highest levels. Yeah. Um, and the person that's come in was actually also president in 2012, which yeah. is the year after the last um, famine that happened in Somalia. So yeah. 10 years later, he's he's basically back in the same place. But I think there is a hope that for somebody who has seen this thing unfold in the past, there's a possibility that... Um, you know, the messages will be well received, the things that need to happen could, could happen faster than if it was somebody who had never gone through this kind of experience before. So we have fingers crossed, most definitely. That's a good, I mean, you often feel like that with Somalia. I, this guy, Dr. Farah, that I know quite well, who's been very, very busy advising prime ministers. And, uh, you know, you just feel the strength of these people. We have similar amazing people in Yemen and Afghanistan who are just struggling to try to keep things going. It's great news. Thank you. And also I uh, hope that the situation in Masabit in Kenya calms down a bit. Uh, it must be terrible. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I wanted to invite, uh, I haven't got anybody else, I don't think, saying ready to talk. I wanted to invite Marianne Hasselgrave to talk because the reason is that Marianne works in and amongst the whole um, Commonwealth system, but also studies what's going on more broadly in the UN and has been asking me, where is the political impetus gonna come from? And uh, also was asking what's gonna happen in the World Health Assembly next week. My day for going there is Thursday and I'm planning to be quite robust, at least in the meetings that I have, but it's it's tricky. The World Health Assembly gets into its own groove. Any thoughts, Marianne? Like you're the last um, speaker, and then to Mahika. Very quickly, I'm concerned because hardly anything is being said about these problems. The problem with the UN is the agenda is set the year before. So consequently, we're talking about coming out of COVID and how you get the interface. Now, it's all very well, you, you're talking about the, the G7. Well, the G7 has been known to make promises, but not necessarily to keep their promises. Even if you go to the G20, there are so many other countries in the world, and we have to get the issues into the high-level political forum when it meets in July. We have to get the issues into the General Assembly is the Secretary General or getting the President of the General Assembly to call for a special session? Or a, I hate summits, but a summit, but you must have something that has an outcome. But the, the, it's what you're talking about and what the Secretary General is doing is outside the political system. And until we can make the link, countries are not going to be dealing with it on a global level. And we need all countries and not just some. And even civil society isn't really talking about it unless you're a specialist in one of the groupings. 
it yeah. goes across. But women, you're, you've mentioned women's organisations. Mm. They haven't quite got there yet. So that's that's my, my concern. Thank you. Mm. Well, um, it's great, this group. I think we are able sometimes to touch things at a very early or early-ish stage. Sorry, that's really unfair. At an early-ish stage uh, and perhaps help to get them up quicker. Just so I am actually going to take what you say very, very seriously. And um, I'll try to use whatever chance I get next week in the assembly, as well as in the World Economic Forum where a bit of the UN goes. But most importantly, I will try to check up whether or not uh, there are plans to try to engage the president of the General Assembly in a session. And with civil society, I mean, there are different groups. We've certainly started talking to Jagan Chapagani of the uh, uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. We're in a conversation with CARE. And thanks to Karen Kaplan, we're just talking to Global Citizen, which is very switched on to this issue and wishes to approach it in a different way from how Global Citizen tends to normally operate, which is through concerts, and wants to do it in a slightly uh, different and uh, multi-centred way. So keep uh, pouring the salt on our tails, Marianne, and to get us moving faster, but also make sure that we are strategic and effective in what we do. To Antonio, Thank you. Did, um, is there anything else you wanted to say before we close, Antonio? But you're, mute, you're muted. I'm sorry, Dave. Just our thoughts on the political view. I think it's, I understand that it uh, requires a bottom up approach as well, but it's a, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift I see in the mentality of the political leaders that we hopefully the assembly can raise the topic. And as I mentioned, it goes into, replace the trade-off mentality the commons mentality yeah okay where are you you've got a fan on so you must be somewhere quite hot i am in, in the us okay thank you everybody mehika please uh, we i think we've reached the end uh and uh, uh before uh, i say goodbye to uh, people one by one mehika please yeah just sharing uh chris's illustration uh amazing uh, as you as you said, Chris, we, we seem to be lurching from crisis to crisis this year and last few years, I think. And I think more recently, it feels like it's hitting everyone and also seems more unavoidable um, and seems to be filtering through the noise of social media, through the noise of celebrity gossip. And it seems to be really um, affecting everybody as well. And um, I like your, as Catherine said, the in inequity and vulnerabilities in the system as a spotlight. I love the web, uh, which just shows how everything, systems and everything is interlinked. Um, and as you said, we, we have many interlocking crises. Uh, and I think it's a good, we should just leave it at, we must never stop always to ask yourself, what more can you do? I think that's a great question just to end this on. And thank you very much, everyone. The next meeting will be in two weeks again, so 3rd June. Um, back to you, David, if you want to say anything. Just bye-bye. Um, I, don't, I don't give up. And it is the incredible, incredible positive energy and goodwill of this group and the many other groups that we work with that is our collective inspiration. Thank you so much for giving it to, to us in this way. Catherine sent me a message saying she was going to have to do something else. Sorry, I didn't come to you. But, uh, no, 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 not, yeah. not at all. I was just, um, I, I, the WHA is in full swing and everybody's doing last minute negotiations. Yeah. But I wanted to say, uh, Rebecca mentioned that we might have a, a plan in the works. And one of the things we've been talking about, I know, right, we are definitely, you know, boil, boil, toil and trouble. Um, that's us. Uh, but we uh, were talking about doing a, a sort of coffee table book that would have the live illustration illustrations um, interspersed through the narratives that Forrest D has delivered. And it would be a kind of cool, as you say, graphic novel interpretation of the last two years. Thanks. So we'll, we'll hook up with your live illustration later and see if we can make that happen. It would be so cool. 
Thank you. To Annie and Keith Appleyard. Annie, my sister, lovely to see you. Keith, nice to see you, but I'm trying to look at your face uh, to ascertain what is there and I can't see it precisely. Hope you are well. To uh, William, my brother, how lovely to see you. And this is a special moment because my sis and my brother are next to each other on the screen. So very, very good. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, and I think my daughter Polly was on just now. There you are. Hello to Polly. I hope you are in good form. Uh, I'm sorry this some of this is a bit depressing, but it's great that the family Daddy. are able to get it. And oh. that might be, yeah. that is Otto, everybody. Oh, We've seen Polly. Otto virtually from when he was born on these yes. things. And that is Otto, who's now talking with his mum, Polly. And hello, Otto. I can hear you. I'm Pappy to the, them because that's, <laughs> that's French for granddad. Pappy. Oh, that's hello, Otto. You look great. Isn't he cute? Isn't he cute? He really is, actually. And he's full of beans, Polly. Full Pappy. of beans. Yeah. Pappy. 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 Yeah, hello. Hi. 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 So Annie and oh, Keith, thank you for giving us Otto for a second. It's always one of my that favorite. is that is Catherine. Otto, as you can hear, Hiya. is now very Hiya. very Hiya. outspoken. Yeah. Good for him. It's hard being a younger younger sibling, I think. Yeah. And he's his brother uh, Isaac is probably around as well. No, Hello. Time out. He's got time out. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Otto, he's in. I've not been behaving. Oh dear. Well, it happens from time Bobby. to time. Bobby. Yeah. Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very, very much indeed for joining. Bye -bye. Hello, Joe. Bye-bye, Joe. I hope Miles and Zara Bye -bye. are well. Nice to be with you. Please keep them going. Annie and Keith, thank you for being with us. That's Bye -bye. lovely. And uh, look forward to being in touch. I hope you're okay, Keith. Don't know what that is. I'm looking at it. It looks like it's something's been done. And uh, um, I had a cataract it? replacement this morning. Oh, that's what it was. Okay, okay. Or uh, Ian B, thank you very much for being with us. It's nice to see you, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, let's keep chatting to each other about digital service agencies. That's lovely. Uh, just uh, to Denise, it's nice of you always for joining. And are you in Nicaragua at the moment, or where are you? Yes, still in still in Nicaragua. Yeah. Oh well, and, and and I mean this cost of living crisis must be hitting people in Nicaragua super hard, and you have no fiscal space to increase social protection at the moment, so it must be quite challenging. Not at all. No. Hello, Isaac. I'm glad to see that you've got one of your books in front of you, and uh, I hope it's one of the books that uh, you're able to read. That's very yeah. good news. To John Luke. Uh, Hello, Isaac. Lovely. To John Luc Poncelet. My John Luc Poncelet is the ultimate emergencies manager, has been World Health Organization representative in Haiti. He knows about crisis countries. He will be aware that this cost of living crisis is going to bite into the lives of people in Haiti really badly. Tessie, I, talk, actually, I can't easily pronounce. Uh, Tessie Rapinarasawa's surname, because that's a Malagasy surname uh, from Madagascar. Uh, but it's lovely, Tessie, that you're here bringing your news from Madagascar and telling us what's going on. And Gawaha Atif, an Egyptian living in Canada, but is sensitive to the fact that in Egypt, food prices are going up, 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 and it's hot, 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 hot. And it's really quite a difficult situation for the Egyptian people. An autumn learner in the Pandemic Action Network doing a lovely, lovely job. I have to ring off now. Mika, thank you for closing us down so beautifully.